Okay. Um, I've got this handout and a jumble of handwritten notes, etc. And I'm going to try and <laughs> somehow organize it. Um, um, first, I thought I'd just say a few things about uh, religion versus conscience. Um, and I suppose I, I can see conscience being used in two senses. One is to refer to a strongly held belief that is not attached to any um, well-recognized religion or the individual does not seeing as having being religious in nature. Um, so it's a, I would call it a residual category in a sense. Um, but then there's another sense of conscience, which I th think is where it's uh, used to up the ante, in a sense, to make a stronger claim. When you say that this belief is really a matter of my conscience, and you see that in the dissent of the uh, uh, Liddell case in the European Court of Human Rights, where her, her claim is presented as based on her Christian beliefs, and then it's, in a sense, elevated to a matter of conscience. So, um, so actually, I'll refer to them in, in, in both senses. I suppose I'll mostly talk about religion and conscience as interchangeable, but um, uh, later on I'll just ask whether there is a special category of conscience claims to be treated differently. Um, <clears throat> Just while I'm on this uh, <clears throat> question of religion and conscience, I, um, I never could understand where the phrase religion and belief came from, which appeared in the uh, Directive 2078 of the European Union in the year 2000. And then I noticed that it's actually been in the European Convention on Human Rights since 1950, Article 9.1. But uh, if you look at Article 9.1, it says, um, find it here. It starts out, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. Uh, this includes freedom to change his religion or belief. So, reading it together with the first sentence, I think religion and belief means religion or other conscientious belief. And I think the the, the case law under the Equality Act has gone way too far because we are, we're trying to maintain a distinction between religion, religious and conscientious beliefs, and political beliefs, which um, would generally enjoy less protection um, or much less likely to be accommodated. And uh, uh, the example I give to my students is uh, if you say you have a political belief that no one should work on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whichever day you choose, that is unlikely to be accommodated. Your response will probably be, well, that's an interesting idea. Good luck campaigning for it. Go talk to the government and parliament, see if you can get the law changed. But if you present it as a religious or conscientious belief, it will be taken more seriously. So when the Granger case talks about Marxism, as being a an other belief, checked by the equality I think that's I think that's going too far. Um, when I arrived, uh, Julian was just talking about conscientious being, beliefs being characterized as irrational, and suggesting that that was inappropriate. But with great respect, I think actually it's the uh, not sure exactly how we phrase it, but uh, this line between religion religious and conscientious beliefs and political beliefs does involve a mm -hmm. uh, distinction between, I'd say, reason and evidence and not being required to provide reasons and evidence. So on the religion and conscious uh, side of the line, we don't expect people to, to explain their beliefs or prove them, etc. On the political side of the line, we do. So in that particular sense, I would say we are talking about a distinction between the irrational or the held on the basis of faith versus the uh, rational and evidence-based. Okay, so turning to uh, point one of my um, uh, outline, um, there, <clears throat> I'd say, well, two different ways you can approach these issues under 
to many of the European Convention on Human Rights. One is as a freedom of religion and conscience question under Article 9, which I would call a liberty approach. Or you can approach it as a discrimination question under Article 14. I prefer the discrimination approach because it allows you to compare the effect on your uh, group, people who share your belief, with the effect on uh, other groups of the apparently neutral rule. And I think that often makes the argument more powerful. Now, I adopt this approach uh, not coincidentally because I, I teach anti-discrimination law, this is an area of specialty, uh, possibly also because um, I suppose my <coughs> first contact with multiculturalism was in the 1980s when the question arose uh, in Canada whether a Sikh man could be a member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Now, to be a Mountie, as they're known, means wearing a ceremonial uniform, a red jacket and a broad-brimmed hat. And so the initial reaction by many people in Canada was absolutely no way. This is a sacred Canadian symbol. We cannot modify it in any way. And eventually that uh, debate was resolved and now you do see uh, Sikh members of the Mounties, just as you see Sikh guards outside Puckman Palace, etc. Um, and of course we had the uh, a similar issue in the Manla case in, in 1983. Um, uh, now just, uh, oh yeah, so um, when I was in including these uh, materials in my presentation, my initial thought was maybe this is wrong for this conference, this has nothing to do with conscience, but uh, I go back to my grouping of religion and conscience together. If you asked uh, a religious in individual why they had to wear their religious clothing to work or in a university, etc., they might well say it is a matter of conscience. I cannot, I, I cannot go to work, I cannot study, I will be excluded because it, it, it is so important to me. So um, I don't think we have to confine a discussion to um, refusal to perform an abortion, etc. I think it can be, can be broader. Um, yeah, so that's my approach, indirect discrimination, case-by-case -case analysis. I've got the Maba case here as an example of a Christian woman who did not want to work on Sunday, where the question of justification came up. Was it too difficult to rearrange work schedules, etc.? Now, the area where I think um, this an analysis should lead to a finding of indirect, prohibited indirect discrimination is generally religious clothing and symbols, because I would say generally they have no effect on anyone else, and we're not talking about taking time off work, etc. There, there are no practical problems. So this right to wear um, religious clothing or symbols is well entrenched in UK law since the Mandela case, although that was in the context of the Race Relations Act. So I think the tendency in the UK has been to see um, accommodation of minority religious practices as part of respecting ethnic minorities, which I think affected the reaction to the Awida case who was, Awida I think was seen as an eccentric white Christian and her claim was not, not taken seriously um, by the UK courts. Okay, so we have this um, <clears throat> well-established protection in the UK uh, and if you go to the European courts you see none. So the Flaminos case, which was uh, which Ian just mentioned, um, should have been applied to uh, Muslim women wearing headscarves, to Sikh men wearing turbans, etc. Uh, Jewish lawyers asking for uh, rescheduling of a hearing, etc. And the uh, Strasbourg Court has consistently rejected all of these cases. And um, so, actually, when we look when we look at the outcome in a WIDA, we have to bear this in mind. Uh, it, one explanation would be, say, Yossi's analysis, that they're saying this is uh, the refusals of the individuals here are based on illegitimate values. But uh, the Strasbourg Court's um, approach tends to be not to accommodate any religious belief, generally. So it's not necessarily 
uh, making the distinction I would like them to make. Um, so uh, this, um, uh, just before I turn to the Euro Court of Justice of the European Union, um, a couple of couple of points. Uh, uh, you'll see when you talk about religious clothing or symbols, then you put it under the category of misguided or irrational. Um, I personally wouldn't do that because I find that uh, uh, potentially culturally insensitive. Uh, um, I, I welcome you to come to King's and, and run it by my colleague, Professor Sapinder Just, who wears a mm. turban. <laughs> Not sure how he would react. But um, uh, on Monday, the, what are we today, 13th, um, 5th of June, I did an interview for France 5 television. Um, they were very keen to know whether the terrorist attack at London Bridge would cause Britain to uh, reconsider its approach to multiculturalism. And I said, no, absolutely not. This has been with us since at least 1983. And I said, no, it's France, you're the ones who have it wrong. Your rigid approach is what should change. And I hope that will be the case uh, in future. But unfortunately, the French approach has now influenced the Court of Justice of the European Union, which has come out with two judgments um, in March in the context of a private company, where the private company can't really, can't claim to be the state and have a duty to be neutral and secular, but even there, uh, that approach has potentially been upheld. Um, right, so um, turning to uh, the Aweed, another case, just one thing I want uh, to say in relation to Peter's presentation this morning um, about uh, Aweed's view that she should wear a cross uh, being ill-founded um, that's an area where I really, I don't think, I, I, I think the court should not get involved. I think all it's, uh, it's enough that she says she, she's Christian, she thinks it's necessary. There's certainly a plausible link between a cross and Christianity. Uh, I don't think we, uh, we should second guess that. My, my analysis of Alida was that, uh, that it was direct discrimination simply because the employer allowed um, uh, headscarves, turbans, and skull caps, etc., but not crosses. I don't know why that case ever went to court. I think they should have uh, just recognized the mistake right at the start. Um, as for uh, Liddell and McFarlane and conscious exemptions in the context of uh, empl non religious employment, um, I've argued against that in the in the modern law review. And I think that is the broad trend that these exemptions are not being adopted. But there are actually three statutory exemptions I'm aware of. One is South Africa, another is uh, Prince Edward Island, my colleague Bruce McDougall in Vancouver drew my attention to this. And most recently Gibraltar adopted same-sex marriage and there's a conscience exemption for registrars. Uh, so personally, I think these are bad policy and adopted for as a matter of political compromise, but not as a matter of human rights principle. If you want to talk to someone who defends this, uh, Albie Sachs, former judge of the Constitutional Court of South Africa, he was speaking at King's last year and I had a discussion with him about it. And his view just seems to be, oh, well, it's just not worth the fight. Uh, why would you want a registrar who was a, against your relationship, etc.? Just have someone else. But, um, you know, I didn't have a chance to ask him, so if the registrar says, no, I don't do Jewish ceremonies for Jewish couples, etc., is that okay? Uh, I don't know, he might, uh, might take a different view. Um, turning over to page two, um, and here I can just... Uh, I'm just trying to say something quickly about uh, conscience claims generally. I've written about the Ashes Baking case, and I think it's actually, uh, well, on the, on the conscience side of things, religion and conscience, it's indistinguishable from Bull uh, versus Hall, and I don't think it will be treated any differently in the Supreme Court. The distinguishing feature is the message on the cake, and I've argued that, uh, for various reasons, 
it's not, it wouldn't be seen as the message of the bakery. Um, that's what the, the, the Northern Island Court of Appeal noted that they would put a, uh, a witch on a cake for Halloween, but would not be seen as supporting witches. So, um, yeah, I don't think the, uh, the only distinguishing feature in that case is, to me, is the forced expression argument, which I don't think is going to succeed in the European Court of Human Rights. Now, conscience generally, um, I touched on this in my Modern Law Review article and uh, had to make some cuts, and so I cut it out, so maybe this is something I could develop for a piece for the uh, book from this conference. But um, trying to see uh, what thread runs through these conscience claims, and I, I did see a list of uh, statutory exemptions. I think it was in a third-party intervention in the OIDA and others case. But the common thread seemed to me to be uh, beginning and end of life. So there were exemptions around embryology, um, abortion, ending potential human life, uh, military service being asked to, to shoot and kill someone. Um, and we don't have a assisted suicide yet, but you can imagine conscience exemptions there. So really quite serious, dramatic, extreme situations, which I would argue are quite remote from the Liddell situation. So uh, the way I've put it before is that uh, a civil partnership registration is generally quite a happy occasion and no one dies. So, um, and so I, I'd be interested to, see, to explore this uh, further. One ex exem conscience exemption that seemed to stick out was jury service. Uh, I couldn't quite see the connection there, unless, uh, I suppose jury service is a form of conscription. Well, I did it in 2012, and the state is telling you for two weeks you have to work for the state, so, but uh, maybe that's its origin, or maybe because juries used to impose the death penalty, I don't know what. But th there were two examples mentioned um, this morning about inoculation and trade union membership, which are not uh, life and death events. But inoculation, I would see that more as respect for family life, for parental decisions, and, and quite easily overridden. If you look at the case on Jehovah's Witness parents and, and blood transfusions, etc., if the state were to decide that not having the inoculation was threatening the general population, that would not be respected. And trade union membership, I think that's better explained as um, freedom of association, including the negative right not to associate, which the European Court of Human Rights uh, eventually accepted. Um, now, <clears throat> if we accept these as, as, as particularly strong conscience claims, the question of degree of complicity arrives, which I believe the Dugan case addressed. And I must say here, I, I'm, I would be quite strict on this. You really have to be in the room, a party to the procedure, not just signing forms, supervising people, etc. And I think that's where the Hobby Lobby case in the US really goes too far, when it's a question of setting up a scheme that will pay for something which is so remote from the uh, owners of the business. OK, and uh, I suppose just to end with this, uh, a trailer for a case to discuss at a future conference. That's um, the uh, Trinity Western Part Two litigation in the Supreme Court of Canada on uh, whether or not you can have a Christian law school that, in, that requires all students and staff to commit to not engaging in sexual activity outside of a different sex marriage. Um, now, this is shifting from the individual to the collective. Almost everything I've been talking about has been in it being an individual in a non-religious context, making a conscious claim. This is a collective situation. You have a religious community setting up a university, etc. And I think what's happened in Canada that is that uh, Trinity Western, for many people, has crossed the line um, because people just cannot see what legal education has to do with religion. And so, uh, although Trinity Western won its first case, um, I think that was because of the effect on the students who were asked to do a fifth year of um, study. I think it's quite possible in this case they will say no, 
you cannot set up a law school which will effectively, will certainly strongly discourage uh, lesbian and gay staff and students from participating. Okay, I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you so much.